I want to start with my vacation pictures. All right, they're not actually my vacation pictures. But uh, I took some of these when I was in Israel back in 2017. And I want to share a couple of things with you just as setting for what we just heard Bud read. Because this will just help put this whole thing in context. Because it's, it brings it down to a very grounded level. And if you go to Israel, there is two things I can pretty much guarantee you're going to see. You're going to see the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and you're going to see this. This is what's known as the Western Wall, or sometimes referred to as the Wailing Wall. And it's not a wall as part of a building or a wall around a city, but it's a retaining wall. What this wall is, is the Temple Mount was built, or the Temple Mount was shaped, and then they put this wall there to hold the dirt in place. And we're all familiar with retaining walls. We have a lot of them. I have one in my backyard. And this is the closest that the Jewish people can come to where the temple was. Because of various ceremonial, religious, political, geographical things, the Jewish people can't go up onto the Temple Mount itself to pray. And so they'll go there to pray. And Christians for millennia have been going to this spot too. This is basically within tens of yards of the spot where God said to Abraham 4,000 years ago, here's where I want you to build me an altar. So 4,000 years ago, God says to Abraham that, and then a thousand years after Abraham, God says to Solomon, I want you to build this temple there. And this temple exists from the time of Solomon to the year 70 AD. And it is this place that is grounded in history. It is this place where God has spoken to people for centuries, for millennia. And so the Jewish and Christian people still go there. And if you get the chance to go to Israel, it's an amazing experience because you're there and there's a, a men's side and a women's side and you go and you pray and there's always people singing. And the tradition is that what you do is you write down your prayers and then you put them in the cracks between the rocks. And so I still remember, in fact, I took pictures of those prayers that I was putting in those rocks that night in 2017. And it's just an incredible experience to be there. And what's really interesting is if it's out of frame in this, but if you go that side, there's a set of tunnels. And if you want to bring that next picture up, please. You know how cities, old, old cities, are just built in levels where it's like something happens and they just build on the rubble. And that usually doesn't happen in American cities because our cities are too young. But if you spent time in Seattle, you know it's happened there. And what happened in Israel is these are tunnels and structures that go back to the time of Jesus, and they're under street level now. And so as you're in these tunnels, you're going along that west side of the Temple Mount. And if you go to the next slide, please. These, some of these spaces in there are really quite big. We don't know what some of them were used for, some of them we do, some we don't. But it's fascinating because... Even though you're not under the temple itself, you're actually closer to where the temple was back in the day. And so you'll see as you go through there, people praying and people being close to God. And it's just an incredible thing. Now, for reasons I'll get to, the temple's not there anymore. But if you want to bring up that last slide, please. Yes, that one. Perfect. This is what the temple looked like in the time of Jesus. This is from a model. Somebody created this huge model, and it's the whole cityscape of Jerusalem in the time of Jesus. And what's amazing about that is you really get the sense for how the temple dominated the city of Jerusalem in the time of Jesus. It is this huge building, and it's up on top of the Temple Mount, so it's the highest point in Jerusalem, and it looks down on everything. It dominated the city. And not only did it dominate the city physically, it was the emotional and spiritual heart of the Jewish faith. People would come from all over the Mediterranean to worship, to pray, to make sacrifices. Everybody in the, in the area of Jerusalem was required to come for sacrifices. In Passover time, the city would just swell to three to five times its normal size. It was the beating heart of Judaism. 
And so that's where this story that Bud just read took place. And this is at the very end of the Gospel of Mark. We have been reading through the Gospel of Mark since Christmas. And we're hitting the end here. And this is literally hours before Jesus is about to be betrayed and arrested and executed. And so the tension in this situation is so high. Everybody is so tightly wound. And Jesus is there with his disciples in this spot. And go ahead and give me the next slide, please. And one of the disciples says, look, teachers, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. And Jesus says, do you see all these buildings? Not one is going to be left on another. Every one of them is going to be thrown down. And go on to the next slide, please. Jesus takes them across the uh, Kidron Valley. It's like a half-mile walk up to the Mount of Olives. And he sits down there, and he begins to teach. And he talks about all this stuff that's going to happen. And he says, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he and will deceive. When you hear of wars and rumors of war, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen. But the end is still to come. And he goes on, he talks about the sun turning black and, and, and uh, famines and how awful it would be to, to have small children in this time and just the trauma and the pain and everything else going on. And this passage is often referred to as the little apocalypse. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have pretty much the same passage here. And it's called the little apocalypse because it's Jesus talking about the end times. Jesus talking about these destructive things going to happen. And the big apocalypse, of course, is the book of Revelation at the end of the Bible. But there's something really interesting, a couple of things really interesting about this passage. And usually when we read this passage, we read it in one of two ways. We read it as a prophecy about the year 70 A.D., okay? Because what happened in 70 AD is the Jewish people revolted against the Roman Empire. There was a lot of factors going into it, but the biggest one was taxes. The Jewish people said, we do not want to pay taxes to these people, so they started fighting back against the Romans. And if there's one thing that made the Romans upset, it was not paying your taxes. So they crushed the Jewish people. And destroyed Jerusalem, burned it to the ground, and destroyed the temple. So if you go to Jerusalem today, you will see the Western Wall, the Wailing Wall. But if you go up on the Temple Mount itself, you will see nothing Christian or Jewish. It is this giant, flat field. and There's nothing Jewish, nothing Christian there. The only thing that's there is the Dome of the Rock, which was built by the Muslims in the 600s. Because what Jesus is saying, it's all going to be destroyed. It's all going to be thrown down. Now, the other thing that people often read this passage is, is this idea that it is a foretaste of the end. And some of the stuff, when he talks about the sun going dark and famines and everything else, he's talking, it's like, this is going to be the end of it all. And my hunch is that it's both. Jesus is talking both about 70 AD and the stuff about the end of the world. But I would submit to you, that's not the question he's asking us today. And here's what I mean. I love history. Don't get me wrong. I love history as much as anybody. But the stuff in 70 AD does not pose us a lot of questions, at least not at first glance. And I think often as Christians, when we read stuff about the end times, we use that as a kind of a way to keep stuff out there. Let me put it this way. You know those big, dumb disaster movies? I love those, okay? Your Armageddons, your volcanoes, your Dante's Peaks, you know, Roland Emmerich, Michael Bay, all those things where the world blows up and inevitably the Golden Gate Bridge gets trashed. It's like somewhere in a checklist in Hollywood that as you're watching those, the Golden Bridge Ridge always gets those. Okay, I love those. Those are awesome. Those are fun. But sometimes I'm afraid that we read end time stuff the same way because it's big and explodey and it doesn't make us deal with the stuff going on in our own lives. We use it to keep it out there. 
And I think what this question, what this passage is really asking us is when stuff happens in our lives, when things shift around, how do we handle it? Because let's be honest, we all crave stability. I know when I'm stressed, I go back to the the comfort food. I'll go back and read the books that I've read before. I'll go back and say, you know what? I know this movie. I've seen this movie a dozen times. I love this movie or I love this book. I'm going to go read it again. And I read it again or I watch it again because it's comfortable. And we know this. This is why the streaming services pay hundreds of millions of dollars for Friends, for The Office, for Seinfeld. Because we're comfortable with them. And we crave that comfort. I might like that new show that you love. I might like that new book that you want to recommend. But right now, I just don't have the mental energy for it. And that's what Jesus is getting at with this passage. You want to go ahead and give me that last text slide, please? What Jesus says is at this time, people will see the Son of Man. And when he says Son of Man, he's just talking about himself. Coming in clouds with great power and great glory. And he will send his angels and gather the elect in from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. I think that's a really cool turn of phrase there, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Usually we don't get that kind of poetic language in Mark. Usually Mark is very business-like, very this happens, then this happens, then this happens. But he's telling us something in this. And this is really what Jesus is getting at. When things change, when everything seems like it's crazy and out of control, I am still here for you. I still want to be here and take care of you. Because think of the trauma that is happening to people in 70 AD when the temple gets destroyed. And yeah, you can say, okay, well, they're Christians now and they understand that. But still, these are Peter and Paul and James and John. And even though, yes, they are Christians and understand Jesus is the Messiah, they've grown up Jewish. They've grown up going to the temple and making sacrifices. And that's been the place where they and centuries of their ancestors have gone to worship. And here something new has happened. And what this passage is really saying to us is it's okay when things change. I want to say this again, and this is kind of a, one of those things where some of you hear it and it's like, yeah, I'm hanging on too tight. I need to repent. And for some of us, it's like, okay, I needed that reassurance. But what I want to tell you is we can't keep everything the same. We can't keep doing things always the same. And it's not that it's a bad thing, but stuff changes. Think about it like this. You have kids. They go from being those cute, messy little toddlers to growing up to being teenagers, to becoming adults, to striking out on their own and getting married and having kids of their own. And you love them and you love each stage of that, but they change and they grow. And it's everything in our lives, our relationships, our jobs, our place in society. It all changes. And that doesn't make it easy, but we can't preserve that. And for those of us who are struggling and hanging on and saying, I can't take one more change, trust me, I get it. I feel it. But here's the thing. Jesus still loves you in that change. And whatever else happens, whatever else goes on in your life, whatever else rocks your world, there is still that assurance that Jesus is there. It is hard for us, but it is a reminder that in the midst of the chaos and in the midst of the craziness that Jesus is always there for us. I was reading C.S. Lewis again. He's got this great essay called Learning in Wartime. 
And it's, I think it was originally a chapel talk that he gave in 1939. So this is as war is breaking out across Europe. As, as somebody put it, the lights were going out across Europe. And he's basically answering the question, why do we do anything in these dark times? Saying, answering the question, why don't we just hunker down, retreat into ourselves, and wait for things to get better? And I go back to that essay on a regular basis because that is such a human temptation. And I feel like, was it 90, 80 years after he wrote those words, I feel like that question still gets posed to us. And what Lewis said is if we waited for things to get better, if we waited for things to get to normal, we'd be waiting until Jesus came back. We'd be waiting forever. And, Jesus, and, and Lewis says, look, this is always the course of things. We're always in the middle of trauma. We're always in the middle of something. And we are not called to hunker down. We are called to love our neighbors. We're called to worship and we're called to glorify God in everything that we do. And friends, I get it. I get it how stressful these times are. I get it how uncertain everything feels. And what I want to encourage you in this time is to remember what Jesus has to say here. The Son of Man will be coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels to gather in his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Know that you have always been loved by Jesus and that he will never let you go. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for gathering us here. We pray you would watch over us and hold us tight and know that we are forever yours. Amen.